There's a fly in here. It's, it's, very, it's actually quite large. Welcome, Drink with James, episode 101. We took a week off. Look, I know there's been a lot of discussion recently. Is James human? Is he more than human? Hard to say. I am human. I do sometimes need a break. I took a vacation. It was my dad's 75th birthday. We went down to the BVI's. We rented a boat. We sailed around. If you follow me on Instagram, I'm sure you got sick of it very quickly. Um, but it was lovely and I felt, you know, relaxed for the first time in uh, a very long time, for like 10 minutes and then I got anxious again, but like there was 10 minutes of bliss where I was sitting on a tube that was floating behind the boat, drinking a margarita, and, and that, in that exact moment, I felt relaxed. And so I feel energized, I feel excited. It was a nice, you know, we had a episode 100, thank you all for the support on that and sending me notes on it. Um, we took a break, we're back for the next 100. So let's, well no, let's not kick it off yet. There's a lot to talk about. First, Polo Classic is this weekend, or as I call it, Christmas in June. Um, one of my favorite days of the year, always such a fun event. I'm sure I will see many of you there. This is coming out after, so it doesn't matter. Um, if you saw me, I hope you said hi. If I saw you, I hope that I said hello. Um, if y'all haven't been to the Polo Classic, you should go back and watch Sydney's episode of Drink With James. I don't know what episode it is, but Tim can link to it. Um, it, is, it is kind of the, I would say, the blogger event of the year, um, kind of anywhere. Uh, it's really fun. Every, kind of like everyone in the industry is there drinking champagne, watching people play polo. I'm very excited about it. I do not have my look sorted out yet. I have some ideas, but not sorted. So there's some work to do there. Other thing, we released two things that I am obsessed with. I hope you all saw it. We have a content search that allows you to search anything that you've ever posted on all of your, uh, all of your connected platforms, all the platforms you've connected before, you can search them all for any term, pull the content that you have around that term across platform, share it with brands, share it with your friends, share it with your mom, share it with your manager, whoever you want to share it with, you can share it. It takes care of reporting. It takes care of pitching brands and saying, okay, this is the work I've done. It is also just a lot of fun. Um, so if you haven't played with the content search, log into four, there's a thing that says content, click it, play with it, it's fun. There's another thing that says insights there. If you have a business account, connect it to four, get the insights, they're incredible. It tells you a lot of stuff that you can't see anywhere else. What's your most rewatched Insta story? What's your, you know, what's your Insta story with, what's it, what's it, the most tap backs? What's the one with the most tap forwards? How many DMs are you getting over the 30 day period? There's a lot of kind of really cool data in there that you, would be hard pressed to get anywhere else. Uh, if you have that business account, connect it, get your insights, play with the content search. It is all very fun. Also, the, uh, the team here is growing. We're, we're hiring for six or seven positions right now. Um, they're all on our website, 4.co slash jobs. Um, take a look. You can certainly apply, but if you have friends that are also looking for jobs and they're in the New York area or they're looking to move to New York, send them our way. We're looking for smart people. We do not hire assholes. That is our, our one of our only things we, we, that like our, our thing, our, uh, what is it? Our criteria, no assholes. Also, if you were like a big like mesh short enthusiast, like if you were just like, I need to wear mesh shorts every single day, I probably wouldn't hire you. Uh, that would probably also preclude you from working here. So other than those two things, you should be good. Um, so 4.co slash jobs, take a look. Now, let's move to questions. Okay, question number one is, uh, follower in and engagement ratios are super important. What is my opinion on blocking spam accounts or bots that never engage with your content? Are they ruining your engagement? Um, or should you think of them as another follower? If you see someone that is blatantly a bot, um, should you block them? I, you know, if you catch them right when they follow you, sure. 
you would have to block a lot of bots or you would have to get a lot of bots following you to mess with your engagement percentage. If you have anything over a thousand followers, you would have to be getting a high percentage of bots that aren't engaging following you to affect your engagement percentage. So I wouldn't worry about it too much in terms of engagement. Um, it will mess with your reach percentage numbers on your business profile. Um, but again, you would have to be so vigilant and blocking so many people um, to make a big dent that I, I don't, honestly, I don't know if it's worth your time uh, to go through and block those accounts. Again, if you're sitting there and you're looking and you pull your activity feed and you see someone following you and it's a clear bot, sure, like just go and block them if you want. Like um, I wouldn't go setting aside time to block these accounts or, or have it be uh, a big part of my strategy for keeping my engagement or my reach percentages up. Uh, I just don't see it as a big, like a great use of your time. Um, I would, you know, instead focus on figuring out, you know, I would instead focus on figuring out what is working, what's getting a lot of engagement, how can I do more of that? Um, how can I, you know, experimenting with different things to try and see what works and what doesn't work, laying out your posts, you know, over the last 30 days and looking at what's your best performing posts or your worst performing posts. Uh, and making some decisions on that, much better use of your time than blocking the you know one or two bots a day that you're getting that are following you. They will probably naturally unfollow you in the next day or so anyway. Um, so I really wouldn't matter, wouldn't worry about it because it probably takes care of itself. Follower to engagement ratio is important. I personally think becoming less important. I look at a few numbers now. We have access to business Instagram business data now, which is you know. 10x the data that we could get with the old Instagram API. And so what I look at is first, what is your average percentage of reach? So I reach on average 23% or something of, of my followers see my posts. And then I do an engagement raise based on that. So 23% of 22,000 is about 4,400 people are seeing a post. Let's say my average engagement, I'm getting 500 likes or comments. There's some math there that I'm not gonna do off the top of my head. Uh, 8%, eight, eight, eight give or take, I think it's about 8%. Um, so 8% of the people who are actually seeing my posts are engaging. So if you do that, your, that equation yourself, take a look at what your average percentage of reach is and then figure out your engagement. I think that is a more interesting number because what probably happens is um, you potentially really should be working on trying to you know, get your content in front of more people um, or figure out what's happening. So we've, you know, what do I want to say? It is becoming more complex than simply followers and engagement. Um, and I think brands are understanding that. That is something that here at Four we're pushing quite a bit. We are focusing a lot more on um, reach and impressions and your engagement relative to those things um, than just big broad numbers because there's a lot of top influencers who are incredible who aren't getting crazy crazy engagement numbers that doesn't necessarily preclude us from working with them or have us pay them less um, especially if they're still reaching a lot of people right so if they're reaching 30 percent of their audience and we see that the benchmark is 20 percent um, well, maybe they just create content that, that doesn't have people hitting double tap. Maybe people have been following them for two or three years and they love their content, but they just don't feel like they need to engage with it anymore. There's a lot of reasons for low engagement. Um, and as brands and companies such as ourselves get access to more and more data, we are going to rely less and less on engagement to tell us the stories that we, we need to understand to be able to work with someone. Question number two is, uh, what are some things that influencers are currently doing that uh, make us as a company want to work with them less? Um, or more broadly, what don't influencers understand about our side of the business um, specifically? So we are different than even a normal brand. Right now, we are executing upwards of 50 campaigns currently um, this week. Think of a big, even a, you think of a brand, even a big brand, that is more than they will do in the entire year um, of, of work. So 
we're executing more campaigns right now for more influencer campaigns for brands than most brands will do in two years, um, much less a year. So we are doing a huge amount of this work, um, which means a few things. One, we have a lot less, less patience for bullshit from individual influencers. If you were a brand and you have a campaign with 10 influencers and you have six weeks to execute it and half of the influencers in that campaign are being a pain in the ass or they're not responding to emails, you, you can still make it work. It's not that big of a deal. It's gonna be a bit of a pain for you, but it's not that big of a deal. If you're here and you're executing 50 campaigns with 1,500 influencers and half of them are being a pain in the ass, this is a huge, huge, huge deal that essentially we can't operate as a business and make money and do what we do if that is the case. And so we are very quick to essentially blacklist an influencer who makes it difficult or impossible to do our job effectively. And one, there is no single influencer on our platform or in the world that is more important than, you know, the, all of the brand relationships that we have. So if you think that like, as an influencer, you are going to strong arm or you're going to stand your ground or do this and that, we could love your content. We could love working with you. The brand could love working with you. It's not going to be worth jeopardizing our relationship with that brand just to work with you. Flip side, we will never, you know, do anything destructive or to jeopardize our relationship with an influencer just because a brand wants us to. Um, but it's an important thing to understand and I don't think some, of the, some influencers understand how much companies like us, um, there's plenty of competitors and, and our competitors, uh, how much work they're doing. And so your even seemingly small request of let's say there's an event and it's the day of the event and you want two plus ones because you have two friends in town. It's, you know, it's not a crazy request, um, but it is now something that, that, you know, that someone at our company has to go to the brand, has to explain why you want a plus ones. The event is full, this and that. We're going back and forth and back and forth. And it, it just becomes a bigger deal. Uh, the brand looks at us and says, why I told you, you know, we told them no plus ones. Why didn't they listen? What's wrong with you for, did you not communicate this effectively? It starts to make us look bad. Um, and so understand that like the amount of emails we get, another example, the amount of emails we get that are, they haven't responded in 36 hours and they say, so sorry, I was traveling. It's like, right. Understand that, that people who work here and the brands, they don't have that luxury. You don't get to be like, sorry, I was traveling. I didn't get to answer my email, um, because this is a job and, and because it's a job. I, and by extension, the people that work here at Ford, don't give a shit if you were on a plane because planes have Wi-Fi and your phone is on all the time. And so like you should be able to answer the email. And so like that ceases to become an excuse. And simply taking 48 hours to answer an email might mean that we would never work with you again. Um, and again, that might seem harsh, but there is so much supply right now. There are so many amazing influencers working their ass off that if you aren't doing everything in your power to make yourself look better, then it, it, you're just gonna get forgotten. I mean, I'll give a quick example. We just did a pitch for a big brand. We really wanted to win. We really wanted to win this, this pitch, right? Um, and we felt like the way the brand wanted us to pitch wasn't showing our personality or the things that made us special. Uh, and so we recorded a cute video of the team um, kind of talking about the product, talking about the brand and about wanting to work with the brand and introducing the people that were actually going to be working on it. In no way did this brand ask us to do a video. We were just like, we really, really, really want your business. And we are going to not just say we want your business. We are going to try and do something special to prove that to you. Um, you need to be thinking in that way in every campaign that you do. How can I make the person on the other side of the computer, on the other side of this transaction, leave this relationship and be like, that was fucking great. And when I go get drinks tonight with my friend who runs PR at another brand, who's doing an influencer campaign, I am going to say, you need to work with this person. They were amazing. 40% of Four's business comes from referrals. 
that is 40% of millions of dollars, like big money, we're not talking small money, like millions of dollars, literally just comes from us doing a really fucking good job and being good at our jobs and our clients telling other people that are their competitors, hey, you should work with this company, they're awesome. Almost half of our business comes from just that one thing. And if you aren't thinking about that every step of the way, there's just probably no way you're gonna be successful here. We've worked with so many top influencers that we were so excited to work with, and they were such letdowns because they were so unprofessional, or they you know, didn't go above and beyond, they didn't do the things they needed to do to try and make the campaign worth it. And so, again, this is not five years ago, this is a crowded competitive space and you need to every single day be thinking about how you can stand out. If not, you're probably screwed. Okay, question number three is, I was super excited to have a new brand send product. The clothes, when they came, fit poorly. Didn't feel comfortable sharing it with my followers. How do I respond? I love this question. First of all, whoever asked it, you know, props for being honest about that. You, your currency as an influencer is authenticity, right? And, and if you, you know, your audience, you can stretch their patience, you know, a couple times. You can, do, you can do those like get money posts where it's like, you know what, this isn't, maybe this isn't a perfect fit. And, and look, I understand that go to 100 conferences, go, ask anyone else's advice and they will be like, never do a campaign that you don't 100% believe in. That's not how money works. If we're just being honest, you are probably gonna do things that you're not 100% behind. You know, if you are a huge Celine fan and Celine is the pinnacle of who you wanna work with and American Eagle comes to you and is like, I wanna give you $10,000 for a post, you probably think about, okay, how can I integrate this? Maybe you like American Eagle 50% as much as Celine, but you don't hate it. I would, never, I would never tell an influencer to do a campaign with someone they hate, but I also don't buy the bullshit of just like, everything you do should just be something you organically love, because I just don't, I don't that's not how advertising works. Um, so, you can sometimes stretch your audience's patience as long as you're being honest, and as long as the product actually is beneficial and it's not a piece of shit product, I will, I will kind of give that caveat. Um, but once you break it, I think you're, you're pretty well screwed. Um, so props for being like, I was super excited about this and then it didn't fit and now I feel like, what do I do? There's a few things you can do. One, email the brand and say, so excited to get the clothes, unfortunately, they don't fit quite the way I expected. Um, I always self-deprecate a little bit. You don't want it to come off being like, the clothes don't fit, like fuck you, send me new clothes or I'm walking. I would be like, I sometimes have a weird, you know, sometimes have a, like uh, weird fit issues with clothes so it could just be the sizing. So we could try new sizing or if, if it's not gonna work, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm gonna, I would like to send the clothes back that you sent and, and I appreciate um, you kind of sending me the product and I, I am su supportive and excited about the brand and you know would love to try a product somewhere down the line in the future because it could be that that specific product doesn't fit you that well but in you know six months they'll have something that does. Um, so the worst thing you can do is not reach out to the brand and not post it. That's the absolute worst scenario um, is, is doing nothing. So reach out say, hey, let's try again, um, or reach out and say, unfortunately it didn't work, I don't think the fit's gonna work on this one. As you know, authenticity is super important, and so I, as much as I want to support you because I love what y'all are doing, I don't think this product is the right one to do it on. Hopefully we can work together in the future. Should I just send it back to the address listed on your website? Send those clothes back promptly, throw a handwritten note in there, it's a small thing, um, but you know maybe they figure their fit issues out in a, in six months. Maybe the person that you were interacting with goes and goes, you know, moves over to Celine, and now they're like, oh, that person was was like 
very courteous and professional. We're going to work with them. Um, so that's how I'd handle that. But just also, side note, making clothes is very, very difficult. And especially for small brands, the fit can be crazy. I, I love this. There's a, a company called Eunice out of LA that makes khakis. It's the only place I buy my khakis. Um, I've, had, I've been wearing them for seven years now, but I still have to go to the store and try on every pair that I buy, even though I get the same size every time. Because if I tried on five pairs of khakis, they would all fit differently because there's still such a small run in production that there's just minor little differences in the fit from each one. So know that small brands have a lot more variation in the fit than um, a larger brand would just because they're figuring it out a lot of times, especially with these new startups. These people have never made clothes before. <laughs> Um, so they're figuring it out. So like cut them some slack um, and, and be honest with them. It'll pay off. Look, I'm happy to be back in the saddle. I'm happy to be attacking the next 100 episodes of Drink With James. Um, I, as always, Tim and I want to hear your questions. Um, so please continue to send those in. I used to say DM me them. I'm getting worse and worse at managing my DMs. So please email is it Tim or Timothy? Tim. Please just email Tim at 4.co um, or James at 4.co, but m better to email Tim at 4.co um, to make sure your question gets answered because I am worthless um, and not great at those things. So reach out to Tim, send your questions. Thanks for watching. Here's the next 100. Cheers.